Can you I hear can me? I can see your screen. I can hear you, but I cannot see you. Yeah. All right, let me just redo that. Uh, okay. It was all working. I was pretty happy with that. And then, oh, it just disappeared. So give me a minute. Do do. I'm back. Right. I've actually got a laptop on the side and I've got an extra little camera in front of me. So if I look in one direction, I get like two cameras. So that didn't work the first time. So you're happy to start? Yep. Take it away. Sounds All right. Good. Cool. So you guys can see my screen and my video. Is that right? Yep. 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 Right. yep. yep. Cool. Uh, I wonder what percentage of uh, recorded lectures and sessions over the last several weeks we'll start with. Hang on. What? Can you see me? Wait a minute. Let me just move this. Oh, I forgot my pants. Um, you know, all of that kind of thing. So uh, my name is Lindsay Ward. I've been an IT lecturer at JCU for about 21 years. I think this is 22 for me. Uh, and most of that time I've been teaching programming. Um, I teach first year Python, and there's two subjects in first year. Uh, I have a third year content management system subject where we actually do PHP, um, JavaScript, other languages, and um, for years I taught C++, C, those sort of things, so, uh, and Java. Uh, so my experience is mostly on the teaching programming, uh, and then every year you sort of start again, you know, with new students. And so uh, a lot of my focus is on um, giving people a good foundation and a good start um, that they can then build on. Um, I have some small children, and so it's funny that my eight-year-old daughter is learning to program in Python at school as part of an extra curricular activity, just experimenting with things. And so uh, sometimes when I watch what my kids are doing there, I think, well, I'll have to fix that later when, <laughs> when they get to my class. Because that's OK. They're just you know, kids. They're having a go. But I guess once you get used to something, you keep doing the things that you're used to, potentially. So um, part of what our focus is uh, today, I guess, is going to be on that idea of best practices. Um, so that's a little bit about me. I'm happy for you guys to open up if it's not a problem in terms of the recording. I'd actually like to know who else is here in terms of your experience, what you're interested in. Uh, my goal always is to be useful. Um, I can talk all day to, you know, recordings, but if there's something that you want to know or um, you have questions, then A, ask during the session. That'd be fine. Very happy to take questions. But also, can we just go around and say um, very quickly um, what kind of programming you're doing? Because um, I believe most of you are um, like PhD research students doing sort of data analysis and that kind of thing with R. That's my um, assumption. But please let me know what else. Uh, we have in the room. Go. Cool. Well, um, I'm Chloe, and my PhD is on coral genetics microbial stuff. So I mostly use R and Bash. Um, I do a lot of alignment and like mapping of different sequencing runs, and yeah, gene expression stuff as okay. well. Good. So that's me. <laughs> Thanks, Chloe. Some of you look familiar to me. I've either seen you around or I've been at some session that you've been at as well. So that's good. Nice to see some familiar faces. Who's next? Hello. Uh, this is Cesar, PhD student. Uh, I was mostly using R, but during the PhD, I started to use Python and I love it. So that's good. Mm -hmm. Good. Next. Uh, Hi, uh, my name is Peter. I'm a researcher at uh, Center Next for Reef Studies. Mostly use um, R for uh, data analysis, um, creating file genetic, or well, plotting file genetic trees, kind of just sort of tidying data and stuff like that. Uh, but doing a small bit of Python and other things as well. Okay, great. And have we got anybody else? Hey, um, I'm a PhD student as well. I'm doing some movement ecology things. I mostly use R, but I'm sort of trying to move towards doing some spatial analysis in GIS with Python as well. Okay. Yep. Good. Thanks, Emily. All right. Um, that, that's good. Hey, I've got a, a, a joke for you to start with. 
What is a pirate's favorite letter? You have to answer. Somebody's got to turn the microphone on. Arr. You'd think it would be the R, but it's the C they love. Yeah, good, cool. And what's funny about that, yeah. my, my son told me that joke, is it works the same if you say what's a, a pirate's favorite programming language. And it can also be the C that they love. So, how good is that? Nice. And I was hoping that you'd know the joke already, but that it went somewhere else. So I'm going to go through a few things. Some of my examples are from uh, my own lectures, my own lecture notes. Um, and I'm just trying to find how to get to the chat because it keeps disappearing when I see it on the screen. So if you want me to see anything, you might have to say it because I can't figure out how to get both. But right, there it is, chat. Oh, I see people were answered. There you go. We want to know everything. Nice. Good. I'll see if I can keep that visible. I probably can't. Uh, so. The idea of a best practice, um, and the term best is a little bit loaded uh, because what's best, what works for one person, what works for something else. Um, what we're trying to do normally in learning something is say, what's, what's a good way to do this? What actually works? And one of the uh, things, I guess, with computer programming is that people want to get something done and they want to move on. And if you're a researcher, for example, who um, wants to use programming to achieve a particular outcome, you're probably not trying to learn programming. You don't want to become a great programmer. You want to get your research done and move on. A bit like someone fixing their car who doesn't want to become a mechanic. They just have a broken car they want to fix and then move on. You're not trying to do that. And so we sometimes develop these, uh, you know, things that work and then we move on. And I've got uh, some examples. I'm going to show you some uh, code uh, in this and we'll talk about why it works or doesn't work. And one of the uh, main challenges that I have with my students, and again, sorry if this comes across a bit like I'm t you know, teaching first years, but um, that's what I do, um, is trying to get it to actually work. What is good, though, is that when you follow things like conventions and understand styles and do things what we might call the right way or a good way or clean coding, then we actually get the, the outcome that we want in terms of correctness and efficiency. We actually get code that runs better uh, and that is more likely to work the first time. Uh, give me a thumbs up in the chat because I'm following that. If you've had the experience of writing your own code, and then looking at it later and not understanding your own code. So you've written something, a bit later you come back to it and you think, what? What is this? What does that actually mean? Right? And we've all done that. I have as well. So if you haven't done that, you probably haven't been programming for all that long. Uh, but yeah, when you write your own code and you can't understand it, the problem is you're more likely to make mistakes and you're more likely to... Um, take longer to figure something out. Like if you have well-organized research notes or you know data, you're more likely to be able to just use that and move on. And it's the same thing with programming. So I hope that kind of uh, sounds like there's a reason for it, that this is a good thing to be doing to try and follow best practices. Uh, do you guys know devnq.org? Has anybody heard of that? So DEV, short for developer or development. NQ for North Queensland. So DevNQ is a group. Uh, Waitama gave us a great talk there once, um, uh, which was, was good. Uh, that's where we met, I believe. Um, and a guy called Andre gave a talk, um, which I've got a link to here. And I'll give you these notes. They're, they're a little bit rough. Some of them are cut and pasted um, from my lectures. But um, Andre did a talk that was about like the, the rules of writing good code. And it was almost like it was straight out of my lectures. Not all of them, because some of them are a bit more advanced, like the automating. Uh, but good code should be readable, so we need to be able to read our own code. Does anybody know what DRY is as an acronym for programming? It is. It's don't repeat yourself. So when we write code and we find ourselves like copying and pasting, any time we're doing that or we're saying the same thing over again, we're probably doing something wrong. No guarantee that it's wrong, but we're probably doing something wrong. The problem with writing the same thing in multiple places is that we've made what's called a maintenance burden for ourselves, right? If we have to go and like reset something in multiple places, the chance is that we might forget to do it in some other places. So you guys know that there's plenty of 
you know, research studies that have been done and then failed because of some kind of mistake that was done in analysing the data. Oh, here's our outcome. Hang on a minute, we made a mistake with this and that's not right. So we, what we don't want is things like false positives, um, you know, missing something that's there because we didn't set a variable or something. So I'm going to um, switch. You should be able to see this. I don't need that yet. Da -da -da -da. And we're going to talk... Um, I'll just give you a summary, actually, of those those five, and then we'll come back to them. So, readable code makes sense. Uh, don't repeat yourself. So, that's a guideline that uh, we might talk about, like spider sense. When you find yourself coding and you make a um, a repetition, you think, "Hang on a minute." It's that question you ask yourself, could I do this better? Uh, testable code. So when you write a function, like in maths, you know, you have the square root function, you, um, you know, pass in 49, what should come out? Anybody want to answer that for me? What's the square root of 49? Just give myself a chance. Right, good. I'm glad we've got some mathematicians among us. Right, it should be seven. How do we know? How do we know if this function works? By testing it. So if we have a function that takes in a number and returns the square root of that number, we can test it. In fact, we can test it a million times by writing a loop that knows what the output should be, passes in the input, and sees if the output is actually what it should be. So if we write code that we can't actually think of a way to test it, like we, we ran it and we got a result, cool, like is that the right result? So we need to be able to think, is this right? How would I write a test to be able to see if it's right, okay? So I might, as a teacher, think, well, how can I know if somebody is um, learning this? So I think, oh, I'll write a test, I'll get them to do something, and then I can see if it matches what I need it to be. So they are, when I think about teaching, I think about testable teaching. How can I see if uh, we've achieved the learning outcomes? And of course, that's what assessment should be. Uh, and the last two we're not going to spend much time on, but refactoring is where you just go and improve your code. So if you've got something that works, but it could make more sense, then now's probably a good time to refactor it and get it to work better. If you've got something that works, but it runs more slowly than it could, and you can think of a more efficient way to do it, it's probably a good idea to refactor it, which could be as simple as renaming something that doesn't make as much sense. That's the simplest kind of refactoring. Or it could be splitting it into functions so that you've got reusable code, you're not repeating yourself or you take a function that you can use in multiple places, that sort of thing. Uh, how can we write a test for a write to function? Right. Um, so, good question. So, one of the things that if um, Lagana just asked about how do we write a test for a function that writes to a file, the first thing would be to separate concerns, right? So, um, the most important design principle from a uh, function point of view is to s have what's called single responsibility. So if its job is just to write to a file, then you test it by reading the file. And so you could write a test that reads the file to see if it works. But be careful if its job is actually to do some calculation and then write to the file, because that's two things, right? So if you have a function that perhaps takes in some numbers, let's just say works out the average of them and then writes the average to a file, that's a problem because what we've got is a tightly coupled two jobs in one function. How do we test it? By reading the file. Well, what we could do is like the square root function, we take in some numbers, we return the average, so the function's job is just to calculate the average, and then we can have another function which takes in the average and writes it to a file. So the first thing is to make sure you separate your concerns so that your function does one thing and then we can test that. And that's exactly part of the point here in terms of um, being testable. So if you've got a function that does three things, it might be hard to test if that second thing actually did what it was supposed to do. Right? So, um, good. I'm glad that answer worked. Thanks. Cool. So, and then the last one about automated is um, a lot of what we're trying to do in programming, especially if we're not just doing it for fun or for learning, is to do something fast, efficient, you know, get it done, move on, take a very large you know, amount of data, process it, figure something out. If we have to be involved in that for you know, set up mechanical sort of things, typing you know, inputs or whatever, then you might say, is there a way that I could make this easier for myself? Could I automate this? Um, can I make it so that, let's say I want to you know, take my work and publish it on a website every so often when I reach a certain milestone? Could we make it so that that thing that I'm going to have to do more than once, I make a way to do it more efficiently? Uh, so I have a, um, a program that invites my students across the entire IT discipline. So that's 
1,500 different enrollments and I download the, um, the class list and then I run a single script which invites all of the students to the channels for the subjects they do in Slack. So I can show you that code if you're actually interested. But basically Slack has an API. Someone in the chat tell me what an API stands for. As you're typing, I see someone typing application programmer interface. So some tools, whether they be websites or hardware, um, have uh, application program interfaces. And so Slack has an API that allows me to be able to, like say, download all the students, combine that with the student class list, and then upload basically, or send messages to the API to say invite you know, the students in my subject to the channel for my subject. I don't want to have to do 1500, um, <coughs> yeah, I like a pandemic interference, that's a fun API um, thing. I don't want to have to do 1500 inter uh, uh, invitations myself, so I automate that, I write a script and I do that. And t it actually took me a long time, it probably took me longer to write it that, than it would have to do the initial um, invitations of you know only several hundred at that time. But I've now used it sort of every several weeks, you know, 50 times and it saved me a lot of time. So I have to be able to write code that makes it easy for me to redo and, and to rerun. And at the moment, JCU doesn't have an API for their class list. Um, I've been asking them for it and they keep not understanding why I might want access to it and thinking it's a security risk. And I say, well, I can already download it via the you know, interface, but I don't want to have to use the interface if I could automate it. I'd be able to click one run button and it does the job of downloading the class list. That'd be great. So I'm going to break down a few of these a little bit more and please keep asking questions as we go if we need to. So when it comes to readability, the most important thing is good variable names. And I tell students and programmers 100% that's a big stretch, it might seem, but 100% of the identifiers, so that's variable names, functions, constants, even file names, should be meaningful. When you're playing with samples or when you're reading Stack Overflow answers, often the context isn't the issue. It's the syntax or the exact, you know, how does something work. And so you'll see terse variable names like X and I and, you know, thing and all of that, whatever. Um, and... Uh, they're not meaningful, but because you see them all the time, you think that they're, they're that way. Um, uh, do we have any engineers with us? Because my experience when I teach a second programming subject is that engineers who've done a first programming subject in engineering have learned bad habits about variable names. And so they'll have something simple like, you know, um, a, a list of names and they'll just call it like, N list because apparently it's cool to use N where we really mean names, right? I would call it names. It's a list of names, names. Um, and so I get sort of X and Y and then a comment that says X means this and Y means that. Uh, I marked a student's assignment this morning and they had like U songs and N songs. It's like what? And next to that was N was unlearned songs and you, uh, sorry, U was unlearned songs. It's like if you have to put a comment to explain what your name is, then that comment probably could be turned into the name of the variable, right? So again, this sort of spider sense, if you think you need to explain how your code works, you could probably rewrite it to be readable from the start. So this is what we call self-documenting code. So. Um, here are some suggestions, uh, forgive the PowerPoint, lots of dots, but basically we want meaningful names. So when you use an abbreviation, even something like max, right? Max and min and some of these sort of things can be like pretty close to, yep, that's a world standard for how that works. But you know, ATM, are we talking about at the moment? Or asynchronous transfer mode? Automatic telemachine? Like, we assume that our reader has exactly the same experience as us and therefore everything that makes sense to us would make sense to them. Probably not a good idea. Um, perhaps one of the most important things uh, is to avoid what's called disinformation. So when you write a bad variable name, if we call it X, but actually it's a list of, you know, um, cat hair lengths or something, I'm trying to think of something relevant, um, then it's just meaningless. We don't really know what it means. But if we have something like I, as a variable called I, then most progr programmers who've experienced that variable have seen it in one context. I is, anybody know what we use I for? 
So you might have seen it in a loop, like 4i in... We're going to see if anybody's seen it before. I see it all the time and I use it all the time. I is common for an iteration counter, an index, even an integer. And lots of times I've seen something like 4i in, and what I expect is a list of numbers, might be a collection of songs or cat hair lengths or, you know, um, frog objects which each contain. And so we might say for frog in frogs, makes sense. We would not say for iron frogs. And what happens then, and I had a PhD student in one of my subjects once, and I keep meaning to see if I can find way back from 10 years ago her code, but she'd made a mistake in her um, code because she had a, a variable name within the square brackets and the index i. And that's what, the, because nothing wrong with the code, it looks fine, except that i wasn't an index, right? We think it is, it's not, right? So if I say, you know, and I introduce you to my family and I say, this is my wife and she's eight years old, then you might think, should we be calling the police? Because there's something wrong here, right? It's not like, here's my whatever. It's actually, I've, I've used the wrong word to refer to my daughter who's eight years old as opposed to my wife. That's disinformation. And what's wrong with that is we then make assumptions about our code when we're reading it, when we're rewriting it, when other people are reading it, and they think, yep, it said wife, that's wife. Okay, let's call the police. Um, there's a problem, all right? Or this person using the square brackets you know, with I when it wasn't actually an index. Cool? <coughs> Excuse me. Pronounceable names, just make it easy when you're talking about your code. Uh, mental mapping, where you know, people say X and then have a comment next to it to say X means this, Y means that. Um, and then try and find meaningful distinctions. If you have, and you sometimes do this where there's you know, similar sounding names, account, account data, account details, account info are all the same, right? If you have a, like a class and you've got uh, um, attributes for that, then you've, you know, each of the attributes needs to be clear what it is. Um, and so my general rule with this is you would never have a generic name and a specific name. So if you had a program about calculating tax, you can't have a variable called tax. What would tax mean in a program about calculating tax? We ask the user for their income and then we figure out their tax. Well, we could mean their tax is 35% or we could mean their tax is the taxable amount or we could mean their tax is the amount of value that they pay as a tax, you know, or the tax refund, right? Because we've got a generic name and all these specific names. So we would need tax amount, tax rate, you know, tax payable or, you know, some of those sort of things. So we need to make distinctions in there. Uh, some examples through there, but again, don't use things that have already been used um, or that are standard practice. Uh, if something's a Boolean, it should sound like a Boolean. And a good uh, way to think of that is code, I've, I haven't actually said this yet, but I say it a lot, code is more often read than it is written. People read code more than they write it. Okay, you might think, oh, no, they don't because I, I don't. Okay, but once it's done, you're not going to write it again. You're going to read it again and make a change. Someone else in the future is going to, you know, want to take it and make a change. And so when you read code, even if you read it out loud, um, make it sound readable, so pronounceable. As you read it, you see what it is. And the same, this any identifier, so functions. Um, so a convention for writing a good function name is to use a verb phrase, and you say, this function will, and then what comes out. So if you're taking notes, this function will, finish the rest of that sentence with your function name, and it should sound right. This function will calculate tax amount. This function will, you know, filter frogs, you know, or something like that, and then the parameters can form part of that name. This function will, you know, generate random sequences, and then we can read it, and we can write, you know, result equals random sequences, or better yet, we can write sequences equals generate random sequences. Aha! Now we've got something that's pretty close to English. So if you can read your code and it makes sense, and someone who doesn't actually understand the language could read it, then it's probably a good, um, good collection of names. And when I say the language, I mean the programming language. You should be able to take um, well-written code in, in any language except Scheme or Lisp or one of those things that doesn't have a lot of identifiers. Cool. Any questions about that at this stage?
All right, here's one I prepared earlier. Can you guys see that? Because I can make the font bigger if you would like. All good? Nope, looks fine. Great. Can I you make it a small bit bigger? I'm going to see if this is where... I always forget where the, the actual... where it is. All right. Good. So here's an example. Um, and I, I was doing some automation um, of... Uh, when I do a screen recording, I press a button on my um, touch bar to get the screen resolution to change. And so I used a script that gave me a list of all of the um, user interface elements from the Mac, and it put it into this single string. And so the bit that I've got commented at the top was just a quick thing that I needed to use once. But even once, I, I called my variable for text, text, uh, and I called the parts that it was split into parts. And parts is a... Um, plural name. You don't have one parts, you have two parts or more than one parts. And then we have names like this, four part in parts. So that singular in plural pretty much can't be wrong. If we have a collection of frogs, four frog in frogs, it's going to be right. Cool? So here's an example. And uh, for those of you who are R only programmers. I've got about half an hour of R experience. Last night I went on and I, I did a little bit of experimenting. So this would be the same in R as like 1 colon 12. That would be a list of 12 numbers. So I've got a list here of values, right? And then I say for value in values and it prints them. Cool. I could also go for I in values. That would also work. So if I run this and I'm using PyCharm writing Python. It doesn't matter whether I call my variable value or i. It doesn't matter. They're the same. Okay. Now let's say I come back to this um, in, uh, in a bit longer and I realize actually it wasn't this that I wanted. So I'm going to change values. Values is a very generic name, isn't it? It doesn't really say what it is. So now instead of calling it um, Sorry, instead of having numbers in it, I've got strings. Okay, so if I run this code, nothing's broken, right? Both of those versions still work. Value is still a value. I is still a value. There's nothing wrong with that. What is wrong is that later on I might use this information and I might say, okay, here I am editing this code and I go, oh, I want to see if I, let's say, let's just print the even ones. Okay, so mod 2, if the modulus of 2 is equal to 0, I'm going to do that and I run this and I get what? Not all arguments converted during string formatting. That doesn't make any sense. I'm not using string formatting. I'm doing modulus, right? This what? And so this is an example, a really kind of forced and somewhat trivial example. But when I see i, I don't think it's a name, right? Because it's i. It's the index. So I should be just iterating through, and I want to see if this number is even, right? Doesn't doesn't make any sense. Or I might want to, you know, go through the names like this. And I use i as an index, okay? So that's the index, and then that's the value in the values. So now if I think about that, I've got my index and I've got my name. Now you might say, well, why didn't you just rename this as, as names? But of course, a list of values, it's, they're, they're both values, whether it's a name or, an, or a, a number here. So it's a sort of forced example, but to show you that if we use bad variable names, then maybe, you know, when it's two o'clock in the morning and you're, you know, writing your code, finishing it, you think, oh, that's right, it's, you know, and you get a mistake. And I've had that experience where I've been working um, a long time and it's not, not actually working for me and I realise I just need to go to sleep um, and that's the solution to my problems and I'll see it more clearly in the morning. But you can make that, you know, work better for you by picking a good name to start with. Any questions about that? All right, I'm going to show you a couple of student assignments uh, recently just on this sort of naming and also um, best practice for like efficiency and that sort of thing. So this is a, these are fairly simple um, questions from a first year subject. Um, and this is, this is my solution, right? So what we've got is we're asking the user for a certain number of um, night's sleep. So this is going to be, this is what we call a constant in 
uh, Python. And a constant in some languages is a, a final value. It cannot be changed. In Python, it's just um, a, a normal variable. But we use the convention. This is super important. We use a convention of all capitals so that the user, sorry, the programmer should never change it. It should be set once because that's the convention, right? If we change it, we're breaking something. It should be like that. Oh, hang on a minute. Something's wrong. So <coughs> I want to say across five nights, we recommend uh, the recommended sleep of eight. And actually just reading this and thinking about best naming, I think recommended sleep, what, over five nights or per night? So I'm going to press the refactor key, which is shift F6 in PyCharm, and I'm going to rename this from re recommended sleep to per night because I asked myself that question. Hang on, is it the total recommended sleep or is it per night? So I want to change that. I'm going to refactor it here and now that's changed in all places. Notice I didn't use like typing to change this. Okay, if I did that, I'd have an error and I didn't use find and replace because refactoring in an editor like a uh, proper um, tool like PyCharm is going to find the things which are actually um, the same variable name. So per night, we want eight hours of sleep. We've got five nights. So we use a uh, for loop to do through each of the nights. We're asking the user for their input. Um, and then we are saying if the input is v invalid. Now, what I see a lot when I look at people who are just getting used to loops, they'll, they'll have a while true loop and then there'll be an if statement inside it and then a break or something like this. And they might do like, you know, some fixed variable name, like let's make sleep hours negative one while sleep hours is less than zero. Well, when was it negative one? That doesn't make any sense. So this is what we call a pattern. This is the standard while loop pattern. And it works almost, you know, 100% of the time when we want to do something with what's called indefinite iteration, like keep going until some situation. Now, I'm using uh, what's called magic numbers here, the zero and the 24 because they're unlikely to change. Like you cannot sleep less than zero and you cannot sleep l more than 24 hours, okay? So I'm okay with those as magic numbers. I could, if I want, refactor this again and say this is the maximum hours sleep per night, right? And there are no other hours, so I don't need the word sleep there necessarily. I could do that. That might make it easier, but I don't, I'm not too worried about some of those sort of things. So these aren't necessarily rules. It's, will I want to come back later and change it, right? So if you have the potential to use something more than once, okay? So see here, number of nights appears twice, then it should be turned into a, a variable or a constant. Recommended sleep per night is only used once, but it's still something that I might configure. So it's at the top here as a constant, because what, what if the you know, scientists come back and said, no, you need nine hours sleep. I want to change it here. So notice that I'm not putting something here where I say total hours sleep is equal to 40, right? Because 40 times five is, sorry, five times eight is 40. So that would be more efficient if I had that literal there. But instead what I'm doing is I'm calculating it. Why? Because otherwise, what happens if I go back and I change eight to nine and I'm still using 40? So this is a problem of data integrity, okay? So uh, who's done a fair bit, or who's done stuff with databases? Like actual databases, um, you know, relational databases, maybe entity relational models, those sort of things. Thank you for those of you who are interpreting my Python for, for R. So there's a rule in database design that you don't store derivable data. And it's the same in programming. I would not store a person's age and their date of birth. Why? Because the age is derivable from the date of birth. If we say you're 42 and then after your birthday you're still 42, well, what happens when you go to, um, you know, you should be 43, but you've got wrong data. So uh, this is important that you don't store things that could become false. So this 40 here is right until I change one of these other ones. So I don't ever store it, I only calculate it. I could store it as a variable if I wanted to, um, but here I must use it to calculate. Okay, so that's the solution. This is the code that I wrote. Are you ready? Let's have a look at some other ones. So I've removed the students' names, but these are first years who've been programming for five weeks. So what's wrong with this code?
Yep, so n1 is a bad variable name. Anytime you find yourself putting like a, um, a number on the end of a variable, sometimes it's a little bit okay or meaningful, but most of the time you're just going, I don't know, it's the first one, the second one, I don't know. Anything else? Yeah, don't repeat yourself, right? So the, the instructions for this said, uh, we should be able to configure the number of nights. So it was a working week five. Let's say we want to rewrite this for a full week, seven nights. How do we do it? We can't do it, right? Because this 40, I'd have to go, oh, okay, what's that plus seven plus seven? I have to figure that out. This looks like it might be working, but there's five separate ones of these. So this is the, don't repeat yourself. Anytime you find yourself um, repeating yourself, you stop and think, hang on a minute, maybe there's a better way of doing that. And what I do with this sometimes uh, for myself and for students is I say, this student was okay with copying and pasting five times. What if it was 700, right? What if we were running a loop over, you know, the frogs in our data selection and we had five frogs, that's cool, or we just copy and paste it four times. What if there were 700? What if there were 7 billion frogs, right? Um, so anytime we just use hyperbole to say, what if uh, something that could be automated, like what I was talking about before, if we, if we want to publish our, you know, um, you know, code output to a website. What if we had to do that like every day for, you know, the rest of our career? We don't want to have to do that manually, right? So how many places would you have to change your code if one of your configuration type variables changed? I'd have to change all, like I don't have to change those five. I have to change the top. I have to change this. I've got to go plus N6 plus N7, yeah. Can anybody tell me what needless sleep means? I can't. There's a couple of problems. One is it actually sounds like needless sleep. Like, you know, that sleep you get when you don't really need sleep, you just have a sleep and it was needless sleep, right? Um, this actually sounds like, I, I honestly can't tell what it is from its name. I think it's a, a number because there's maths involved. Uh, <laughs> um, but it doesn't sound like a number, right? So your variable name should sound like what they actually store. And then have a look down the bottom, we've got if, elif, elif. Cool, and in, um, I believe in R it's else, if. Elif is just a shortcut that Python decided to use. So what's on the screen here with these if, elif, elifs is actually a, a pattern that people use when you want to handle some cases but not all cases. So there is potentially an extra situation that we don't want to handle. So uh, you can, uh, here's one I prepared earlier. This is a collection of programming patterns which are all uh, in the context of Python but would not make sense in other languages, right? So this if elif with no trailing else is an on-purpose pattern that people use when they want to handle some cases but not all cases. So as an experienced program, when, when I look at this, I think, what is the else situation here? What's the other case that they're not handling? And there isn't one, it's actually just poorly written code. So we've got the greater than, the less than, and the equals to, which is everything. So there is no other one. So what's happening here is if this situation is true, we, as in all nights is less than recommended sleep, then we know that answer already. We didn't need to ask that question. So it was inefficient to ask a question that we already need, uh, knew the answer to, right? So it's not just, you know, poorly written code from the point of view of it could be easier to read. It's also inefficient, which means it's going to take longer. Cool, I'm glad you got the, the example um, of the patterns there as well, no worries. Good. Okay, um, so let me just go through this fairly quickly. I actually was expecting to be not too long, so keep asking questions if you've got any. Let's look at another one. And so we were talking about don't repeat yourself. So this one's a, a simple kind of, um, we ask the user for two scores. It's, you know, on course and exam assessment. So we've got a total. And then if they get less than 50, they fail. Um, if they have a practical score that's higher than their exam, they become a field agent. Otherwise, they're a desk officer. And on top of that, if they get uh, like 90%, then they get onto the honor roll. So this student, once again, has copied, pasted, copied, pasted, um, and you look at how many places you'd have to change that if we decided to reorient something. See this question here? That's the same 
as this question here. Why do we need to ask that? We don't. And that hyperbola that I talked about when I said what if it were 700 or whatever the number is, what if I want to change one of my outputs? If I'm ever saying it's not the honor roll, we're doing this for a, let's say we wanted to rewrite it. So I go to honor, change it there. Oh, I've got to change it here as well. Okay, so if I have to change something in like more than one place, it probably needs to be fixed. So this actually works, right? So from the point of view of correctness, there's nothing wrong with this code. It does produce the output it's supposed to, but it takes more time to write, it takes more time to run, and it definitely will take more time to maintain if we need to. I'll show you a couple of other quick ones here just because they bring up some issues. All right, so this one, we talked about how constants shouldn't ever be changed. So as soon as I see that, my brain just goes, hang on, that needs to be fixed. Uh, the other thing that my brain is doing when I'm reading this code is I'm looking at error messages. So if you're driving your car and a red light starts flashing, what does that tell you? Should you just keep driving? I'll try and ask simple questions so that you can answer me quickly. This is my feedback loop to see if you're looking. Should you keep driving, just ignoring the red light? No, you shouldn't, right? It's drawing your attention. There's a problem that needs fixing. So PyCharm, as an editor, is doing a good job right now of giving me a gray flashing light. It's not a red like everything's broken, but it is, um, uh, it is telling me there's a problem here. And uh, I'd been programming in Python for quite a few years before I ever used PyCharm, and I tell students, I tell people, that it made me a better programmer after two minutes of using it, because I saw things like this that says you're breaking the convention, right? So there's a shortcut key in this editor, it might be different in others, right? That auto formats the code, it fixes all of the formatting things that are inconsistent with the convention or the style. And so 13 lines just got fixed there. It doesn't fix your typos like parameters or whatever, and it doesn't fix everything. But all of those warning lights just went away, and now I can focus on my code a bit better. This here, and it's the same sort of thing in, in R, that's a comment. What's the usefulness of that comment? Give me a thumbs up if you think that's a helpful comment, because there's a first loop and a second loop. If you can find the thumbs down key or thing to give me a, a thumbs down if you think these are unhelpful comments. Right. I thought you were being a little bit generous when you said not totally useful, but you said totally not useful. Yeah, there's absolutely no benefit to these comments. What it actually does is it makes it harder for me to see what is going on. So if I delete these like this, Good, I see some emojis in there that make sense. If I delete them, the code is easier to read. So sometimes people learn that commenting is good because it makes your code easier to understand. Commenting is bad if it's just there for the sake of I thought I needed to put something. You put comments in when it's actually helpful and you need to explain something. Now if you need to explain a variable name, probably just write a good variable name to say. So this, this code is a little bit sort of intractable when you just look at it on the screen. You think, why is, what, what? Is, is like a, an if and then a for, what? It's just too much work. And look, we've got that same pattern on the bottom. So if the total is not greater than or equal to 40, why ask the second question? We don't need to ask that question. We've got the same sort of problem there as well. All right, and that's, that's probably enough of those. There's the same sort of problems back in there as well. I'm going to try and wrap this up. So we talked a bit about using the IDE and things like auto-generating code, uh, refactoring, style wizards, um, shortcut keys. Um, it's, it's good as you um, get used to tools that you think about your own efficiency. So um, you don't want to waste time doing something you could be doing faster in the same way that you write code to do things to go faster for you. You as a developer should learn to be able to do your own um, coding faster, right? So sometimes people, you know, just use a plain old text editor and they don't learn how to make it go faster. Whatever you can do, but if you can improve your speed, your own work, you'll find that that's helpful. Uh, I'm not going to talk about version control except to say that it's the same thing in terms of uh, meaningful messages. So you should hopefully be using version control and maybe uh, Waitama's got something lined up to 
you know, uh, run somebody do a, a lesson on that. But when you write commit messages to say what you uh, what this commit will do, again, like the this function will, that's the imperative voice. The same thing for commit message. This commit will, and then it says what your um, actual work was when you commit that. So descriptive messages certainly helps. I just want to leave you with this, which is that you are working on like publishing something, yeah? So your code will be part of that. Not necessarily in a thesis, but it'll be accessible. So it's your own work. You want to be proud of it. So when you think about like best practices, how do you follow the convention? Um, and just quickly, I had this prepared. So here's um, conventions for R, right? If you're using R or Python. So we saw the ones in the editor, you know, um, R is the same. Where, where your spaces should go. Um, all of that kind of um, convention following isn't just about like being a good citizen of the programming world. It's also about writing code that's easier to read, um, that's probably faster for the computer to process even potentially. And of course it means you've got less stuff to have to fix and make sense. So be proud of what you do and also you're like contributing to the global knowledge. So if someone else wants to take your work and develop it and continue working with it, you want to make it uh, not like I looked at their code and I couldn't understand what it was doing and it was all meaningless so I had to start from scratch. You want to be able to make that, um, you know, discoveries that make a difference, that help people to be able to carry on from there as well. Cool. That's it from me unless you've got any questions. Thanks for that, Lindsay. It was so great. I uh, really enjoyed it. Good. Does anyone have any questions? Hi, Lisa. I have a question. It's just based on on the examples and what you were saying. Like I, I have never taken an official Python course, but sometimes you know I find mys myself wondering if I should use like a um, object-oriented programming uh, approach or more like functional. In particular, we're working with databases, like you know, create mm -hmm. classes. I wonder if you have any view of, of, on that, or there is. If, I mean, this is uh, something that is merely uh, um, a thing of taste, or do you think that there there are guidelines? Yeah, it's a good question. I think sometimes when you don't know what else is out there, you think maybe I should be using something else. Um, and so probably it's a good idea to talk to people like the e-research team who do the Hacky Hour, um, David and Daniel and some of those uh, people who've got experience in a bunch of different languages to look for the right tool for the job. So those um, patterns that I was talking about, I, I try and think of them as tools. If you see a, a um, Phillips head screw, you know it's a Phillips head screwdriver because that's the right tool for the job. So um, in a sense what you're asking is should I be using like a you know a ratchet and the question is well if you've got a bolt that needs a you know ratcheting you know socket for it then yes but if it's a screw then you need a you know a screwdriver so there's no right answer. Um, I think there are languages like like Python and I'm not totally sure about uh, that have like multiple paradigms within them, so you can use objects or not. Um, the other thing I'd say, so there's no, you know, yes, this is the best for it. I mean, R is designed around statistical analysis and the sort of things that most of you are doing, so it's a good choice from that point of view, and it's also the community that's helpful with it. Um, the other thing that I'd say just quickly is um, there's a, a thing about uh, pre-optimization which is where you, in, before you get something kind of working and you're happy with it you try and focus too much on the should it be this way or that way and you can come back to that and refactor and improve it and I'm not talking about like let's just call our variables x and our functions y because we can just do that once and get it right and it's easier to start with um, but you might find that later on there's a better way to do it um, but you you don't want to figure all of that out first and actually not make much progress to start with. So, it, unfortunately, the answer has to be kind of it depends, but yeah. Good. Oh, anybody else? I'm all out of water, so that must be pretty close to the end.
thank you for saying thank you to those who are and appreciate it. I'm, I'm glad it was interesting. That's my attempt or my goal. Actually, I can ask another question. And yep. this is, yeah. So I am also using PyCharm, but sometimes it gets very slow when when it's loading. So I wonder if you have any view or if you have seen to use any other. Uh, uh, you, you get a Mac. <laughs> <laughs> There's a joke. Um, I use a MacBook. That's all right. Uh, you can have a look and see if you're using any extra plugins that you don't need or something like that. I don't. I don't know of anything where the the IDE would be slow for a reason. Um, do you mean slow when it runs your code or when it's just booting the program? Uh, when boot. When booting. Yeah. yeah. You probably just um, <clears throat> see if there are any sort of extra features that you've got loaded or something that you can unload. Not sure. Yeah, and then you, you know, search and see if other people have had the same issue and found solutions. Go on, Rotama. I had that problem with PyCharm, and I swapped to Visual Studio Code, and the Python plugin in VS Code is really good, actually. Um, and it has a lot of the features, I guess. It's not as fully fledged for Python as um, PyCharm, but it still like gets most things done. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's important that you don't get too dogmatic about things that are, should be held fairly loosely. So I would certainly not say this is the, the only one or the best one or whatever. Um, and Visual Studio is something I use for other, as in VS Code, for other things. And that's, that's cool. Like if you find something that works and it's good, that's cool. As long as you're not um, like, it's got to be this way, dogmatic about it, or you're not like getting benefit from it, you know? So figure out like in each place what you can do to go faster. Uh, question about, do you think learning C++ would be useful? In R, code can be sped up using C++. I've had to implement C code to speed up my code in R. Yeah, I guess that's, a, again, tool for the job. I don't think it's useful to pre-optimize in the sense of I'm going to go and do a course on C++ just in case I need it. Or, you know, I'd like to use Fortran because I found some code that used Fortran and the more I know, the easier it is to read. You're still kind of goal-oriented. You know, if you're not learning to be a, a long-term developer and this is a tool then um, try and get these sort of best practices and, and style. Um, we didn't talk exactly about the, the Python, uh, variable naming standards, you know, things like under snakes, uh, underscores in variable names, that's the same in Python as um, R, but it's just whatever language you're using. So in if Java, JavaScript, you'd use camel case variable names, use underscore. So it's just what's the best sort of situation. Um, but taking those practices with you into different languages. So the, the answer of better in terms of this language or that language or that tool is, is all contextual, I think. Um, and if you find somebody else that's done it a certain way, similar to what you're doing and found, you know, maybe written a blog post on how to speed up or something, then go for that. I wouldn't have an answer to that in terms of the specific. I have another question, but this is mostly for, for everyone else. It's one, one of the reasons that I really like Python when I just started to use it is that maybe by accident, the first thing that I found was like the Python styling guide. Yeah, that, that is quite useful. I was wondering if, if people who use R knows about an R styling guy or something like that. Uh, so that's what I was showing you on the screen before. Let me just, um, so it's tidyverse. I'll just paste that into the chat as well. Yeah, that was one of the first things that I looked for. I was, I was going to go through it a bit more specifically until I uh, just decided I'll focus my stuff on Python. So I did actually have an R project open, just ready to give it a bell. Then when I saw you had to use a, a left arrow instead of an equal sign, I was like, nah, I'm out of here. <laughs> that was a joke, but that's okay. All right. Well, thanks everybody. And if you've, you know, got any other questions about things, you guys can sort of talk about them. I'm happy to sort of answer through Waitama or something um, and yeah just I uh, hope that you kind of have some good attitudes in terms of as you write code thinking about like you know um, you know that begin with the end in mind like you're thinking about somebody else reading it or you know it being published and um, 
a lot of times when you just learn a few kind of good like patterns, this is the way that you know uh, best practice suggests doing it. You find that it's actually more helpful in the long run and um, less time overall, not more. So, thanks for having me, and I'll uh, go back to. I've got a staff meeting now, actually, so I'm going to do that. See you, everybody. Thanks, thanks, Lindsay. Well, yeah, awesome. Thank you, Lindsay. And I think next week's meant to be a basic session. Um, so we'll get that like sorted out and send around to everyone. But in the meantime, all keep safe and stay inside and you know, don't lick any walls and stuff. Cool. Thanks, Chloe. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much, guys. See you next week. Hey, see you next week, guys. Hi. Bye.